this is a really dark story some some brutal parts of this um just like to thank michael for coming thank you, on mate. thanks for having me yeah. on yeah privilege so what part of london did you grow up in then grew up in isleworth so sort of just outside central it's like greater london um close to richmond and twickenham for anyone who doesn't know isleworth so not too far from here sorry yeah not too yeah. far from guildford yeah that's right yeah and was that a easy growing up for you or was there difficulties yeah, so it was tough because before the age of one, my 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 mum and dad had broken up before I turned one. My dad was violent towards my mum, so my mum was like, we was on the run from my dad all the time. Like it, even when my mum was pregnant with me, we'd moved to three different bail hostels and then ended up in a council estate on Ivy Bridge Estate, which is in Isleworth. And um, although it was like this community that didn't have much, there was like this mad community spirit there as well. You know, we was all broke. Everyone was battling demons. You know, a lot of the fathers weren't around. So it was hard, but there was also a community spirit. I think the most difficult thing was growing up so close to Richmond and Twickenham. So like if you've, you, a lot of people who know Twickenham, you've got a rugby stadium there, right? So occasionally when rugby matches were on, you get a load of rich people rock up right next to your house. If you've ever been to Twickenham, you see them big tower blocks. That's where we lived. So we had neighbours above us, below us, either side of us. And then you get these rich people turning up, which as a kid just seemed like they had so much compared to what we had. And it created this divide, this alienation from us, me. I can only speak for myself, but definitely for me and them. You know, especially even more so when I got to like 10, 11 and I started going into Richmond and I looked at these houses, I looked at these cars, I looked, even looked at in m and at food that we could never afford. And I was just like resentful, really, because like not only did they have stuff that I could never afford, in my judgment, they'd never experienced stuff that I'd ever experienced. I'd experienced more at the age of 10, 11 that I, I felt they'd experienced. Before we get to that, yeah. man, I don't, sure. I don't usually get into the history of the parents and stuff. Yeah, sure. I was so moved by your, the story of your mum. Can you just give us the story of your mum yeah. before we proceed? Yeah, so my mum come from a traveller family, the Mohans, um, massive traveller family, all like, uh, massive in the UK and over in Ireland. And she was born in a caravan at the side of the road. And um, that was in Ireland, was That it? was in Ireland, yeah. And um, there was about, I think it was about 15 or 16 brothers and sisters. And uh, it was just a, the traveler's life from different camp to camp, earning money as and when you can. And then um, when they came to Dublin, they um, came into contact with social services. And the social services basically looked at what was going on there with, um, with my mum's dad, Tommy. Mohan and um yeah there was there was just you know violence towards the kids and uh they said right we're taking every kid under the age of 16 into off you and into care and so my mum went in with her two sisters and three brothers there was older siblings who got to stay with them but anyone under 16 went into Nazareth house which is basically a children's home in Belfast run by the nuns and the priests I've watched a few of those documentaries about the nuns yeah yeah, it was it was it was brutal. You know, the stuff that happened just wasn't okay. You know, like they would allow volunteers into the home. They'd say we need help volunteers to teach your kids a piano or or help with the gardening. When really these were all like paedophiles in disguise mm. who just come in and and just do stuff with the kids. Mm. You know, yeah, it was brutal. But anyway, my mum left that children's home when she was. Um, 16 and she left and then her parents were waiting at the gate to have a pre they had a organized a pre-arranged wedding which was a common thing in the traveler community back then to settle debts and feuds and stuff like that and um and my mum just avoided them for long enough she you know got back to the home got some money and literally got on a ferry to london with nothing she just just Brave had the, woman just had the clothes on her back mate and she she had this vision in her head oh i'm gonna get to london i'll be safe and she went to the, there were the signs on the doors saying no blacks no irish no do no dogs no blacks no irish and she was like really confused at like she thought i'm gonna be safe here <laughs> and it was like 
I really admire her though. You know, when I think about her, all that going through at 16, yeah. I'm like, what a legend. Yeah. You know, and, um, but she made it through. She worked in hotels and pubs and she, because she was like a waitress, uh, a barmaid in the cabbage patch in Twickenham. And that's where she, she worked there for quite a long time. She also done cleaning work. She was a cleaner for Seb Co, uh, Sebastian Co, the, the great athlete. Um, I think he's Sir Sebastian Co now. Um, and yeah, so she got by and then she met my dad. And what was the circumstances they met? I think it was just like in the pub. You yeah. know, he was a young, good looking guy and she was like a very beautiful young Irish woman in need of sort of some protection because she'd always been on the run all her life, really. And uh, and my dad was that, you know what I mean? But on the flip side of that, he was also quite unpredictable, had drink and drug problems himself and was violent towards her. So neither of them were equipped with the tools on how to be in a relationship or how to be a parent. You know, they both they both had really like dysfunctional upbringings, really. And was he violent towards you? He wasn't. Well, like he left before I was one. Okay. You know, yeah. so like... I have a real vague, vague memory, like, and that's it. It's, yeah. it's like, you know, I don't have anything else. So what was the early signs of crime? So the first, I think the first crime that I got involved in was in Richmond. And it was sort of like to even the score up a little bit, you know, and I was like... Robin Hood. <laughs> well, it was just... <laughs> I'm not proud of this stuff, yeah. right? And I'm not glamorizing crime. Mm -hmm. But for a kid who grew up with like nothing, I, could, I had no control over nothing. I had no control when my uncle Tommy would come in my room and abuse me at night. I didn't even have power over that. And just, just let's stop there a second. Then, so who, who was this Uncle Tommy character, and how did that come about? So when my mum left the children's home, she went to London. She got a job. She worked. She met my dad. She got a council flat. At the set, while all this was going on, her siblings were getting older in the children's home. So when they got to 16, they all wanted to get get out of Belfast too. And so they came over and visited. So my auntie Kathy, my auntie Bridget, my uncle Franco, and the youngest, my uncle Tommy. And so sort of my mum, although she experienced a lot of the trauma from the childhood, the abuse and all of that, um, she'd had sort of 10, 11 years prior to that of some normality in the, in the gypsy life, you know? So she was able to realise what was going on was, wasn't wrong. But my uncle Tommy, however, being the youngest, he was like, I think he was like one or two years old when he went in there. And he was like just relentlessly abused every day by priests and paedophiles. They're like, it's all he knew. That's all he knew, you know, <gasps> as a kid. And he basically, he, he he left the home and he needed he needed help. And, you know, mum wasn't going to turn him away. And so he came and he lived with us. Um, and, you know, it's sad because he never knew any different. And I had to forgive him for what he'd done to me. But all the abuse he experienced, he'd done to me. Yeah. Um, and I hated for years, years, I hated, hated. And in the end, I had to forgive him. I had to see his innocence that, you know, he was a baby and that's all he knew. Doesn't make it right what he'd done, but me carrying around that hate wasn't productive for anyone. But yeah, he, he, he abused me and then I think the guilt got too much for him and he just disappeared one day. And then he went back to Ireland and he abused a whole load of other kids. And then one of the kids testified and... um Within two weeks of that kid testifying in Northern Ireland, he was uh, he was murdered on the streets wow. of Belfast. Yeah, Jeez. yeah, that's sort of over in Belfast. I think with the paramilitaries, that's they don't stand for that sort of stuff. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. So all right, so you said you mentioned then you see in this like wealthy neighbourhood and these wealthy people coming in watching the rugby games and stuff. Mm. That's like getting you tempted to do stuff. And what were your first crimes that you committed? So. First one, I think, was shoplifting, I think, in uh, Marks and Spencer's in Richmond. I think I was just like, you know, I'm going, I'm getting some of this food. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds crazy. I think I, was, I think I was like 12 or something. Any idea what that food was? 
Mate, I can't even remember. <laughs> it probably would have been just like, you know, the sandwiches and stuff like yeah. that. I can't even remember. It all looked amazing, the food, yeah. you know, like. <laughs> so I was like, I'm getting some, you know, I'm even in the, squ the, the playing field up a bit. And I was just terrible. I got caught like straight away, you know. But you didn't have a technique. I did. Well, there was there was a technique not to get caught, but I was also a scruffy young kid from the council estate. So I didn't fit in in Richmond. I definitely didn't fit in in Marks and Spencer's in Richmond. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, like when I'm sort of floating around, it was it was probably you know, they probably thought, yeah, we can see what this kid's up to. He's not yeah. to no good, you know. So yeah, got got arrested for that, and then um, could they press charges on that because you were young? I think that was it because I was so young. I got a caution. Mm -hmm. I think it was just like a slap on the wrist. And um, anyone who's been to Richmond, I mean, the police station isn't there anymore, but the police station used to be out the back exit to to Marks and Spencer's, mm. and that was one of the things where they they called the police, and this, they the police took me through almost like the high street of Richmond <laughs> thinking like um, I just think they thought this would teach me a lesson I'd be really embarrassed by it and in fact it done the opposite it, I felt proud that like I was like yeah see this ain't such a pretty little neighbourhood now is it <laughs> look you know I'm getting dragged through and I'm like effing and blinding and I was just an angry young man I was just so angry I was like I made a decision really young I was like this world isn't a friendly place and if I'm going to survive through this life, I need to create someone who's tough and scary and mean. Because if the people who you're meant to love, who you live with, do this to you, then what is everyone out in the world going to do to you? So it was the abuse that made you think that the world is not a friendly place? That was like the final straw. Okay. Yeah, so dad left. There was violence between dad and mum. Um, there was an, the, a couple of scenes that were neglect. You know, I caught... I, I, was playing with a tin opener as a boy and I was naked little boy and wrapped it in my testicles that was oh. a yeah that was oh. another thing yeah yeah how did that pan out then oh mate it was just I woke up one morning and yeah woke up one morning everyone was asleep they'd been drinking the night before went into the kitchen and I didn't have a nappy on and I just, as a young kid, saw this tin open. I didn't know what it was and just started playing with it, just fascinated. And I was so engrossed in playing with it. I just like didn't even realize that I was twisting and twisting and twisting and it was my testicles. And, um, and yeah, it was like um, I blacked out after that. I blacked out, yeah, yeah. So there was that moment. <sighs> There was that moment, which, you know, was tough. And then Uncle Tommy arrived. And one of the ways Tommy used to silence me and intimidate me, and I never knew if he knew what happened to my testicles, but I suspect he did. But he would grab me by my testicles, mm. you know. And um, mm. it was, um, yeah, it was just fucking hell. It's just, it's just horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> 